been blessed with the Lord leading me to different topics throughout this week. And I could have had probably several messages written in the last three days. Um, I also learned how that it's important for me when I get these little tick messages, if you will, uh, I have this little book that, that was given me through one of the classes that I attended, and I never used it. And it's a little, what do you call it, journal type thing. And so I started writing it down. Before I knew it, I had this particular message today almost written after writing it down. So. Our message comes from Exodus in two different chapters and Romans 2, 5 through 11. And this is about stubborn, being stubborn. But the Bible doesn't talk about it as stubbornness. It talks about it as stiff-necked people, as you will hear, hear and see. In Exodus 33, 3 through 8, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in, the mid, in your midst, lest I consume you on my way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And in it came to pass, and it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And 34, 8 to 10. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation, and all the people among whom you are shall see that the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I do with you. And in Romans 2, 5 through 11. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to you one according to his deeds, to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immorality and immorality mm -hmm. Im, huh? 
Immortality. Immortality, sorry. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. And I think that last verse that I just read is something we need to remember. There is no partiality with God. I entitled this, How Stubborn Can We Be? A farmer tells a story about a herd of horned cattle in a separate pen from the rest of the herd. One day he was feeding them and found that one of them, a red one, had got her head stuck between the bars of the fence. So he walked over to her and tried to help her get out of the predicament she was in, only to end up in a struggle of wits. The farmer took a new step, a few steps back for a breather and thought, you are so stubborn. Then he says to himself, how many times has God felt that way about us in this way? That we are too stubborn to let him help us. We went back, he went back over to the cow, red cow, and twisted her head to help her out, and she cooperated. When I look at, looked up the word stubborn in the concordance, it gave me several verses to look up, but every one of them did not refer to it as the word stubborn, but as stiff-necked or hardened heart. Why do you suppose we become this way with this stiff neck or hardened heart? Is it because we still do not trust that there is a God? Or is it because we are guilty of sin and are afraid that we have done so much wrong that we cannot forgive us God, that God cannot forgive us for what we have done. I have heard many times over that I have these words, I have done so much I can never be forgiven these things. You know, I believed that for a long time. Even though when I asked God to save me, I still believe, how can he walk me through all this with what I've done. The scripture reading for today, while it was addressed to the people of Israel, there are still valuable to us today. We are the stiff-necked people of today. Those of you who say that you can never be forgiven for the things you have done throughout your lives have never been so wrong at all. The first thing that you have already done is recognizing of your sins. That they are more than you feel that God could possibly forgive you for. The very fact that you realize this part of the, of the human condition is a step in the right direction. You see, we, you, and I can never completely clean up our acts all by ourselves. 
If you're trying that, forget it. It's not going to work. You need some help. I may remember one comment from a person saying in a prayer, Lord, I have let you down. And the Lord said to him, you couldn't have let me down because I was holding you up in your time of troubles. That's powerful. You see, we don't realize how many times we've been pulled out of the mar because of what we chose to do. And we have only one person to thank for that, and that's God above. Israel did not get through the desert on their own. The Lord was with them and carrying every one of them through the worst of times. He gave them a cloud by day and a light by night. He gave them food to eat, water to drink. And the sad part of that is they still complained. God's love and mercy toward them never failed. It will never fail us either. The most gracious thing we need to hang on to is that He, God, is always with us even when we bring things against ourselves. Even when we bring things against ourselves, is God always there? He will pull us out and he, you will feel the jerk sometimes. He is there to help us through it all. When we call on His name, we will be heard. The thing we need to hang on to is that He always is always waiting for us to turn to Him and call on Him. So that he can not only save us from sin, but from ourselves as well. The one thing we have to remember is we can't stand here and be so bold and proud of where we're at that we're unable to humble ourselves and say, Lord, help me. We just have to be humble enough to realize that we cannot do this life alone without assistance from Him. I cannot tell you enough about what it means to me to be where I am today because if it was not for Him, I would not even be here to carry out the mission He called me to do. You see, God protected me from a PTO shaft. He protected me from a fall, a very healthy fall. Not so healthy as in, but it was a good long distance. And he's been with me for 75 years, carrying me when I'm stumbling to bring me here today. As it is written in the book of Peter 5, 6 through 8, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary of the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now some of you might sit there and say, well, I still got this burden of sin that I don't think he can help me with. Didn't I just tell you, therefore humble yourselves and call on the name of the Lord. Humble. Drop the macho stuff and gain some 
comfort in knowing that you're not the greatest person in this world. Admit that you can't handle it. You know, I used to be upset because every time I do something and I think about what has happened and it's good and I cry. I don't worry about it anymore. When my feelings come out and it shows that I have feeling. And especially when I'm standing up before you. And sharing God's word. He's not just speaking to you through me. He's speaking to me through what I'm telling you. And if he ain't, I'm no good. Because if it's not speaking to me, I don't belong up here. The key word here is humble. Does not give others power over you, nor does it make you any lesser of a person than others by being humble. What it does, it brings you down to a level where God wants you and he knows he can speak to you through that humility. Humility is a tool of success for the believer in Jesus Christ. Humility is a tool for us who believe in him. A humble man is not puffed up or too proud to making oneself lesser in any way, but allowing one to confess with dignity in repentance of his sins. It doesn't make him any less of a person. Romans 3.23, for all of sin and come through the glory of God. All. That means the best preacher you've talked to or heard of, and you and me, and those who we don't know. We are all in the same boat. C.S. Lewis writes on page 121 in Mere Christianity, the vice I am talking of is pride or self-conceit and the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called humility. You may remember when I was talking about sexual morality, I warned you that the center of Christian morals did not lie there. Well, now we have come to the center. According to Christian teachers and essential vices, the utmost evil is pride, unchastity, anger, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea, flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the, that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. If you think it is exaggerated, think again. When we humble ourselves, being thankful for all that God has done for us, we will be drawn closer to him in a much better state than we once were. If we are told that we will be given a new heart once again, not if, in, we are told, when we are told, anyway, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
This is to the repentant individual who comes to the Lord and says, Lord, forgive me for what I have done. And if you want to go down the list and list them, so be it. But tell him that you are asking for re forgiveness of your sins. You're repenting. You're wanting something different in your life. And what God will do will give you a heart, not of stone, but of flesh. In the end, after all is said and done, no matter the things you are or I have faced over the years of our lives, we can be sure of one thing as it is written in the book of Philippians. Chapter 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at all, at the name of Jesus, every, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So no matter when you decide to turn to the Lord and, and humble yourselves and seek forgiveness for your sins, no matter when that is, if you do it at all, even if you don't, every knee will bow. and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you can take a few weeks, you can take a few months, you can take 20 years if you have that time left. But keep in mind, he also says you neither know the day nor the hour or the time that he will come and take you home. Are you prepared to wait that long and be left out? Now is the accepted time. So I'll close with these questions for you to think about. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for the day that he will come and take you home to be with him? Or are you willing to become the Lord? And, and are you ready and willing to become the Lord's army in the end? Or are you going to wait and end up where you don't really want to be? I come across this song yesterday and I just want to read the words to you. I want you to think about it. Because I'm kind of in this boat. It's called, The Lord Still Lives in This Old House. If this earthly tabernacle should be dissolved today, I'd trade it for a finer one that would not pass away. But till the day arrives when it's time for moving out. Tis such a sweet place to know the Lord still lives in this old house. The sweetest fellowship I've known has fortified these walls. And peace has reigned since he's been walking up and down these halls. With snow upon the rooftop, now, and these hinges near worn out, it's a, such a joy to know that the Lord still lives in this old house. To him it's been a dwelling place where he kept my hand in his, to me, a home away from home 
is all it really is. It sure ain't fine and fancy and all I can boast about. It's after all these years the Lord still lives in this old house. Now there were times he had the right just to up and move away. And there were times and days I knew it took God's amazing grace to stay. But he never left this old building. Once that, once, that's why I can sing and shout, because after all these years, the Lord still lives in this house. To him, it's been a dwelling place where he kept my hand in his. To me, a home away from home is all it really is. And it's true, sure ain't fine and fancy and all that I can boast about is after all these years, the Lord is still in this old house. I just, as I listen to it, Twice, in fact, uh, it moved me very heartily. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the house is yours, is you. Because he's taken up a home in you as a believer. Don't wait another day for those of you who haven't accepted Jesus Christ. Because the longer you wait, the harder life is going to get. The harder it is going to be for you to make the right decisions because Satan is bound and determined to win over as many as he can. But God has a better plan. And I can honestly say, you can trust me on that. Because it's in his word. And he has kept his word to this day and he will continue to honor it. Because someday Jesus will come back. And it will be up to you whether you're ready or not. Let's close with him 555.